geology students, there are two kinds of shovels, pointed end shovels and square end shovels. You use them in two different distinct ways. When you're trying to remove a lot of bricky rubble, like we're digging in right now, you want a pointed end shovel. When we get out of that and we're into soil without a lot of rock and without a lot of brick, you want the flat end shovels. We actually take the flat end shovels and we sharpen them so that we can turn them sideways and skim the dirt and peel off a layer of dirt maybe only an eighth of an inch thick. So square end shovels, you can use them in the top layer, but they will not be as effective or as efficient as the pointy end shovel. Let's review. Pointy end shovel, remove a lot of dirt rapidly. Flat bladed shovel for shovel skimming to pick up evidence of features like trash pits, house walls, burials. Coal. Coal. Shiny black stuff is coal. And there's two different types. There's bituminous coal and anthracite coal. Oh my god, do we have to know which is which? Yeah, this is bituminous coal. Bituminous coal generally breaks in kind of flat planes like this. Anthracite is almost going to look like glass in the way that it broke. And, and so there'll be a little bit of both of these coals. Where are they getting this stuff? There were coal mines in Missouri. There were coal mines obviously still in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Probably is this a Missouri coal. It's now extinct. Could there be fossils in here? Yeah, but highly unlikely. And so, I note, I, what I do is I make note of coal when we're finding it. Because when we get down to the Native American level, this isn't going to be showing up in the archaeological deposit. It's another clear indication we're looking at 19th century. And when they dig your backyard to your house, they're not going to find any coal, right? Because we don't, if you got a coal furnace, you're unusual. Because, uh, though you'd probably be lucky. And so that's what this stuff is. It's uh, it's coal. It's one of the common things here in this dirt. Back to work. Yeah, the good news is this dirt is moist. What would this dirt be like in August? It'd be like digging through concrete. First we're putting dirt into a bucket. I am now replacing the bucket without dirt. Thank you very much. Taking the dirt. Asking, does anybody need dirt? You look like you can use some dirt. Okay. So gravity's our friend for yeah, we, we just uh, just give it a shake and the sediment goes through the uh, bottom of the stream for the most part. And now we're left with the, the debris. So it out the bricks and the limestone and shake it a little bit more. That was your... And and anything uh, you find in there, CJ, goes to the cardboard box over there on the side. Consolidated yeah. settlement can be around your hand and... and uh, all the big stuff that we're not interested in, the building debris, the limestone, and the brick. Now we can sort through the smaller stuff and hopefully find something interesting. Occasionally find a piece of glass or a nail or uh, ceramics. The most interesting thing we've found so far. This is about as small a piece of pottery as you want to worry with, but it's diagnostic. I mean, it's no larger than your small fingernail, but it's a piece of a teacup, and it's got a design decoration that's been transferred on. So it's called blue transfer wear. It's like taking a decal and it was put on the ceramic before it was glazed. So nobody hand painted all that. It was mass produced. It's from the mid 1800s, and that's really nice. 
But what you want to find is the hand painted teacup because the hand painted teacup predates the Industrial Revolution. That's going to be when we know we're in the French colonial level. We're still in the American Civil War level with a teacup fragment like this. So it's the 7th of May. I'm Michael Fuller from St. Louis Community College. We found some bricks, we found some limestone down here, which we're calling Locust 3. Might be part of a building. It may just be the way some of the rubble got dumped in when this building was destroyed. The soil below this level, though, seems to be changing. So we're going to change our stratification at that point in time also. Right now on this floor surface, we're still finding fragments of asbestos, but we're also finding teacup fragments from around the time of the Civil War. What's really interesting is in the east wall, right here, there's a really nice vertical drill hole. An engineering company came and drilled a hole from the surface all the way down to bedrock, and when they finished that hole, they filled it back up with a light-colored clay slurry. And that's why this intrusive feature is different from the undisturbed soil with bricks on either side of it. So I'm really glad to see the drill hole, because that tells me that I'm exactly where I expected we would be, because we wanted to excavate near that drill hole, since it indicated that this was the shallowest deposit of historic material, and that there might be prehistoric midden in that drill hole area. So maybe we'll know that not by the end of the day. This is just the second day of digging. But I hope we may know that by the third day of digging. This is a very simple level that allows me to take elevations on the artifacts and the runes that we're finding. One of the things I'll do is I'll have a student hold the stadia rod. I'll look through this scope and see what the elevation differences are. I'll record those in my field book. After about seven or eight elevations, I'll sit down and do the calculations to make sure my numbers are correlating. If I haven't made a bad reading or the student held it at the wrong location. By doing this, though, we keep track of how deep below the surface the various artifacts and soil layers are. So, when we're doing elevations, first thing we got to do is get the stadia rod pulled out. Always pull that from the bottom and click these little units. If they don't click, then our readings are useless. That's about all we should need for here. I want to take three readings. I want the first one right there in the top of that piece of limestone. I want the second one on the top of this stack of limestone. I want the third one on the stack of that limestone right there. Is that here? All right. Okay. We'll get a few more after that. One, two, three. All right. Excellent. Always kind of hold it so that these numbers are facing towards me in the scope. All right. Good. gals are digging and doing a wonderful job of it. I'm doing the paperwork. And the paperwork means that for every level that we're digging through, I've got to make a sketch map of what's going on. I've got to make a written description of what's happening. And on these forms, I will eventually record all the information about the artifacts that are found in each one of these layers and bags. So that when someone 100 years from now is trying to figure out what we found, they'll be looking at these records. I also keep a record book this file. This is where I keep my first set of notes. 
this is going to be really hard for someone to understand because it's not very legible and there's scribbles and sketches all over. But from this, I go to the form right there. This is in waterproof paper. You can throw me in the Mississippi River and when they fish me out of New Orleans, my notes will still be readable. This is not. 